crystal blue waters of the Caribbean, studded with a necklace of tiny tropical paradises. If you're looking for that perfect desert island, this could well be it. It's a coconut bar dreamland, palm trees, white sand and sparkling seas. And beneath the waves, reefs of magnificent coral. But behind the idyll, the islands of the Caribbean are struggling to survive. Every part of the region, its seas, land, animals and people are under stress. A complex web of life is becoming unstable, for this paradise is balanced on a knife edge. Most of today's Caribbean island people are the descendants of African slaves. On this estate, they continue to dry cocoa beans in the traditional way. Slavery, of course, has long since been abolished. These days, there are other, much more liberated things to do, like looking after tourists. The natives seem friendly. In the last decade, the Caribbean has become a playground for nearly a million tourists a year. It's sold as a tropical paradise, but for the people who live here, what is paradise really like? Well, there's one part of the year when tourists are nowhere to be found. The hurricane season. For that perfect climate has another face. Every autumn, it brings the threat of disaster. In 1980, Hurricane Allen ripped through the Caribbean at 170 miles an hour, killing, destroying homes and crops, and wrecking the island's few factories. In fact, violence is part of their whole history. Sweeping northwards in a gentle arc off the top of South America, the islands of the Caribbean were bitterly fought over two or three hundred years ago by the French and British. They wiped out the small native Amerindian population and imported slaves to grow sugar and spice and all things nice for Europe. The islands are tiny, most of them a mere 30 miles long, but they were conceived by giants. Between 20 and 40 million years ago, they were fashioned in fire and brimstone, born as volcanoes.
Mount Pelée in Martinique is perhaps the region's most famous volcano. It erupted in 1902, killing 29,000. Today, this is the most active, St. Vincent's Mount Soufrière, 4,000 feet high, its crater nearly a mile wide. It's a smouldering giant, but on Friday, April the 13th, 1979, the giant suddenly erupted. The volcano, the very creator of paradise, destroys it overnight. A hundred million tons of rock and ash fell to the ground, covering crops and homes with choking dust. 20,000 were evacuated, a fifth of the population. Between the volcano and the hurricane, life here is poised on the edge of disaster. Now, every week, the island sends its best climber up the volcano. His steps are picked up by delicate seismometers, placed to warn of the first rumblings of the next eruption. His task, to descend into the mile-wide mouth of the smouldering mountain and discover if the giant has moved. Eighteen months after that massive eruption, on the edge of the crater, life is returning. This is how the islands must have looked soon after they erupted from the sea all those millions of years ago. But it wouldn't have taken long for those first simple plants to become magnificently transformed. As the volcanoes died, they became covered with rich, dense rainforest. The rainforest, an explosion of foliage, the result of a tropical plenty of sun, rain and nourishing volcanic soil. But the earth is shallow. To remain upright, trees must buttress their trunks. Some plants, like the lianas, abandon the ground altogether and dangle from branches aloft. Somehow, across the waters, came just a few animals. Creatures like the iguana. And the boa constrictor. It's thought the animals arrived by accident, carried perhaps on driftwood by the currents from South America. One of the very few mammals to make it, the agouti. Some animals were brought in by man for food, like this tortoise. Tucked away on their own little islands, the animals bred, and over the years, some evolved into unique species. <laughs> 
In the Caribbean, you'll probably find the most famous examples, not in the wild, but on a postage stamp, parrots. The island of Dominica has two completely unique varieties found nowhere else in the world. The island of St. Vincent proudly displays its very own parrot. And only 20 miles away, there's a totally different species on St. Lucia. It's a spectacular example of evolution in action, but it may not be around much longer to look at, for these parrots are in danger of becoming extinct. Almost the only place to find them is in the cages of collectors. And yet once, the forests were full of them. The reason they've disappeared is sickeningly familiar. Over the years, most of these beautiful birds have been cut up for the pot and made into parrot stew. Nowadays, few people eat them. The birds are too rare. Instead, they're caught for export to collectors, anxious to get hold of a specimen before they die out. Hunting the Caribbean parrots is illegal, but the law is broken. After all, the birds are now worth up to 15,000 pounds a pair. Something positive is at last being done to protect them. Parrot one to parrot two, parrot one to parrot two. Are you reading me, over? Um, I've just uh, seen a, a large Equipment scale. and money has come from the World Wildlife Fund for the most threatened bird, the parrot of St. Lucia. A small area of forest is being patrolled in a desperate attempt to save the few that remain. This is one of them. Only a hundred others are thought to exist. They're among the rarest birds in the world. As the last St. Lucian parrots survive on their principal food source, the fruit of the Arale tree, they flicker on the edge of extinction. The parrot has come to symbolize the major problem of the islands themselves. For this magnificent bird is dying out not only due to hunting, but mainly because much of its own environment has been destroyed. Vast tracts of forest have been laid waste to make way for bananas. In the lush tropical heat, bananas grow fast, producing crops all year round. Sold for export, they're a regular and vital source of income for the islanders. Today, bananas now replace the sugar cane that was grown by the plantation owners of old. Centuries ago, the valleys and plains were turned into massive estates to grow crops for Europe. So the locals, for their food, had only one place to go, up. On the steep slopes of the virgin rainforests, they hacked out small plots of land to farm for themselves. called slash and burn, a widespread practice throughout the third world, but on the tiny islands of the Caribbean, its impact has been enormous. Unwittingly, the islanders have set in train a series of destructive processes that ecologists are only now beginning to understand. Much of the original rainforest has gone, 
Year after year, more and more forest has been cut down and planted into individual small holdings. It's typical subsistence farming. Here, locals grow a variety of produce, a few bananas, vegetables and root crops. Centuries of nutrient build-up by the dense forest has made the land fertile and the plants flourish. The following year, the land will be burned and then planted again. This time, the land isn't quite so fertile. The crops don't do so well. Stripped of its forest cover, nutrients rapidly wash away through the shallow soil and the land becomes exhausted. And so, it is abandoned. For the subsistence farmer, it's no problem. He simply moves on and cuts down another chunk of forest. But what has been destroyed will take a hundred years to mend. Denuding hills of rainforest is a major conservation problem in the Caribbean. And its effect is not just on animals like parrots, but on people. Some islands have begun to run out of water. In the past, when the rains fell, the thick forest mantle was nature's storage tank, releasing water to the rivers evenly through the year. But now it's common for some rivers to run completely dry. On one island, the French have come to the rescue. These are the rainforests of Guadeloupe. They're probably the best preserved in the Caribbean. The island is French territory and receives massive aid from Paris, so it's got the cash to spend on protecting the environment. Their rainforest is untouchable because it's become a highly managed national park. River water here is abundant. And as it flows down towards the coast, it meets on the margin of land and sea another of the tropics' mighty creations, the mangrove. swamp is one of the most unusual and productive of nature's works. It is entirely composed of one type of tree, the mangrove, one of the few capable of growing in salt water. Among the inhabitants of this tangled world of roots, are some unusual species of crab found nowhere else. At the waterline, oysters cling to the roots. It shows we're close to the sea. Mangroves aren't static. They're constantly on the move, trying to colonize more of the ocean. They do it in a rather ingenious way. Their seeds drop off into the water and float downstream, anchoring on the next mudflat. Once established, the seed sends out prop roots, and so the mangrove extends the land by almost literally walking out to sea. Here underwater, fed by nutrients falling from above, is a rich, soupy world of sponges, sea squirts and anemones. <laughs> 
But the real importance of this strange, rather unattractive world is to be a nursery ground for fish. It's a perfect spot, well protected and full of good things to eat, and young fish thrive. But like the rainforests, this vital habitat is fast disappearing. Mangrove swamps are unsightly. They're no good for agriculture, so why not dump rubbish in them? Mangroves are also good news for developers. They can be bought for a song, ripped out and turned into elegant marinas. Belatedly, some islands are beginning to get the message that long-term, mangroves are worth more than tourists. A stiff campaign is being waged against hoteliers to save this mangrove swamp. If the campaign fails, Yet another vital natural food factory will be lost, and no young fish will grow to populate the next great tropical wonderland, the coral reef. In the Caribbean, coral reefs abound. Its most classic reefs are in the Grenadines, a string of tiny islands, some only a few hundred yards long. For a small island, corals are the great protectors, bulwarks against the sea. Close to shore, the reefs begin. Outcrops of coral forming isolated patches. Strange geometries in a lagoon of plain white sand. At the edge of the lagoon, the reef proper begins, a castle wall of coral. This is elk horn coral, standing like soldiers nature's own rampart against the invading sea. Occasionally, there are casualties. Six foot of coral will tumble, broken off by the surging waves. We're now a hundred yards offshore, and as the seabed slopes away, the reef front begins, plunging into the deep. This is the open ocean the domain of sea monsters like this harmless, rather frightened octopus. At 40 feet, the silvery trumpet fish hides by imitating the shape of a pillar of crimson sponge. Further down, an orange sponge six feet high. Gently swinging in the currents of the ocean. Yet more sponges, tiny ones, sheltering under a thin canopy of coral. Like sponges, coral has an astonishing variety of forms. The black line is part of a whip coral, very different from the leaf coral behind. Down at these depths, many corals spread out to catch the light. 
Though it looks like rock, coral is in fact made up of thousands of microscopic animals that need light to grow. If, for example, it gets covered with sediment, the whole colony will defend itself. Here's what happens, speed it up 500 times. Wriggling between the ridges are the coral animals called polyps. Though they're individuals and not connected by any sort of nervous system, they all seem to act together in this quite remarkable way. Like a lot of other animals, the polyps live by catching prey. Here some fireworms have been grabbed and will be digested. What makes coral so hard is the limestone the animals produce around them for protection. As the polyps increase in number, so the limestone grows, building up the reef. The hard corals are the constructors, the architects. The soft corals provide the decoration. This richly productive undersea world reaches its climax in the fish. Migrating out from the mangroves, young fish find the reef a refuge and a plentiful source of food. Some eat the algae that grows on old reef fragments. Often, they'll eat the coral itself. Territorial damselfish defends its patch against all intruders. Elsewhere in the reef, strangers are more welcome. These surgeon fish have a problem with microscopic parasites and are assembling for a wash and brush up. They've come to a part of the reef where tiny fish called rats live. And they like parasites, so the surgeon fish let the rats eat the parasites, and everyone's happy. This elaborate food web has another member, man. The Caribbean islanders have always relied on the reef fish for food. For years, they were able to maintain a balance between what they took and what the seas could produce. But recently that balance has broken down. The fish are beginning to disappear. One of the reasons is this. A new type of fishing, 
the underwater trap. Within a few days, the bait has done its work. Now picked clean, it has attracted all kinds of fish, juveniles and adults, wanted and unwanted species alike. Up on the surface, the boys that mark their position often come adrift. The traps lie, lost forever, entombing fish for year upon year, or making them out of the reef. But there's another more distant threat to the reef, from on land. Storms come in the autumn, and those subsistence plots of ground, slashed out of the forest, bear their steep slopes to the falling rain. The rivers run with mud, and as they spill out into the ocean, sediment empties onto the coral reefs. Coral can shrug off a certain amount of sediment, but in water swollen with mud and silt from the hills, it will succumb. In some parts of the Caribbean, soil runoff and activities like dredging and sand extraction have choked the life out of the reefs, coral, fish and all. But recently the reefs have met an even greater threat. In the island's struggle for survival, tourism has been hailed as the great saviour. This is Barbados. Tourists are neatly packaged and delivered to the beach. Once the Europeans came here to mature their crops, now there are better things for the sun to ripen. Many of the islands feel it's a case of tourism or bust, and in Barbados, they've turned it into an industry.
It's argued mass tourism has brought wealth to Barbados, but some fear its impact on the local population. The affluence of the holidaymakers invites envy and hostility, so that increasingly it's not always service with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> Tourism encourages a distorted sense of values. The fisherman becomes a beach boy. Like any artificially introduced species in the animal world, tourists upset the ecological balance. It's not just environments, people can be polluted too. Day after day, petty salesmen pace the beaches. One of their most popular lines is a genuine souvenir of Barbados, a piece of its coral reef. Throughout the Caribbean, when the tourists come, it's all hands to the reef. With the advent of scuba, there's no limit to the amount of coral that can be collected. The most highly prized comes from the deep ocean, the rare and beautiful black coral. So you gotta get the big black one is seventy dollars. Black coral, being so dense, well, takes problem. decades that's to grow. Tree. There's little of it left. But in Barbados, most damage to the reef may have occurred at night. After dark, when the guests have left the beach, is a perfect time to empty out their sewage. Down an underwater pipe it goes, into the sea, and straight onto the coral reefs. Barbados, concerned for public health, has now banned the practice, but the damage has already been done. Aerial surveys have shown that in the last 25 years, as Barbados massed more and more hotels on its coastline, up to 50% of its coral reefs have disappeared, strangled, it's thought, by pollution. For a fragile island, losing coral reefs isn't simply an aesthetic problem. There are practical consequences too. Lacking the protection of the reefs, in the hurricane season, the coastline gets a hammering. Year by year, the beaches on Barbados have been eroded. One day, perhaps, this Kentucky fry will slip quietly beneath the waves. Now hotels are forbidden to discharge raw sewage, but other things can be chucked in the sea with impunity. Just behind this happy holiday maker, there's what looks like a bubbling spring. In fact, it's wastewater straight from the hotel's kitchens. But chances are it contains detergent known to be toxic to all marine life, fish and coral included. And so the destruction goes on. Another development that could threaten the fragile Caribbean islands, oil. 
This site belongs to Hess, a US oil company. And here on the island of St. Lucia, they're constructing an enormous oil transshipment terminal. Half a hillside has been removed and a bay dredged to make room for giant supertankers. Environmental laws discourage ships that size from US waters, so oil companies need somewhere else to discharge their crude. Desperate for income, the islands of the Caribbean are a perfect spot. The project has aroused controversy and security is tight. Our cameras were kept out. Its supporters argue that the island gains from extra employment and revenue from royalties. But whatever the benefits, is it really appropriate to the island's way of life? It looks like progress because it's development, but it's development that serves the interests of another, richer society. For the people of St. Lucia, this is a monstrous irrelevance. Now, Hess plan an oil refinery here too. The company already has one in the Caribbean, 400 miles to the north, in the Virgin Islands. It's the largest refinery in the world. This huge installation dominates the island and its whole economy. If the company were to pull out, the country would probably collapse. It's a mere colony in an empire of oil. And there are the obvious problems. Oil fouls the beaches. And there are the inevitable accidents. In July 79, the world's biggest oil tanker disaster occurred in the Caribbean. Two supertankers collided off the island of Tobago. There was a massive oil slick which miraculously missed the beaches. But the lesson is clear. As supertanker traffic increases, so does the risk to the islands. One accident could engulf them. Now, the Caribbean governments, with the help of the United Nations Environment Programme, have drawn up an action plan, a coordinated and positive attempt to tackle all their environmental problems. Already, a few projects have begun. These are the US Virgin Islands. Here, one of the coral reefs has been turned into a national monument. There's an underwater plaque to prove it. Buck Island Reef is famed for its beauty, and by establishing a marine park, the authorities intend to keep it that way. Fishing and collecting are banned. The problem is, of course, controlling the hordes of tourists. So when the sightseers arrive, they're marshaled together and kept on a tight rein. In the conservation battle, could this be a vision of the future? 
Environmental protection like this costs money. Here, the Americans can afford it. But what of the less developed islands? Many of them have gained their political independence, but economically, they're just as dependent as ever. They're among the smallest nation states in the world, with a fraction of the revenue of a minor London borough. Basically rural economies, where even in the heart of some capitals, cattle may safely graze. The Caribbean islands, for all their tourism, are part of the third world with typical third world problems. According to the experts, the population has already exceeded the carrying capacity of the islands. They are also classic banana republics. Up to 80% of their income comes from bananas, sold under exclusive contract to the giant multinational Geest. Of course, Geest controls the price, but at least it's guaranteed, and it provides employment and a regular supply of foreign exchange. For, astonishing as it may sound, these tropical paradises must import most of their food to survive. It's clear that they must, at the very least, grow more of their own, and projects like this are already pointing the way. The islands need sound agriculture to stop their soil falling into the sea. They need to be more self-sufficient, develop things that they can control, rather than having their land planted with bananas, oil tanks and tourists. There was a time, centuries ago, when the islanders could support themselves. They were content with a small plot of land and a handful of animals. There was a balance with nature. But that is disappearing. As the numbers and demands of the people have grown, the question now is, in paradise, how can they possibly survive? 